wellnesscouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. You're listening to A Quirky Journey, the healthy family podcast with your hosts, Joe Witten and Fuad Kassab. Welcome to A Quirky Journey. This is your host, Fuad Kassab, and with me is my best friend, uh, my business partner, and the woman that I like to annoy the most in my <laughs> life, Joe Witten. Hey! Joe, good morning. <laughs> good morning. And uh, today with us on the show is someone who um, not just focuses on what to eat, but a variety of things uh, in, that will make your life exceptional. Uh, Joe, would you like to introduce our guest today? I would. So our guest today is our good friend, Marcus Pierce. Hi, Marcus. Hello, Joe. G'day, Foo. I could listen to you guys all day. I just <laughs> love the dynamics of your voices. Oh. And Foo, the way you introduce Joe is so beautiful. Oh, Best he, friend, yeah, business sweet, partner. <laughs> Tell you what, beautiful to listen I'm to. Lucky. I've been sitting back here. <laughs> Absolutely, you are, Joe. And Foo is very lucky himself. And sitting back here having a listen, going, This is beautiful listening to you guys talk. Oh. And, um, <laughs> It's a, yeah, as I said to you on the phone yesterday, Joe. Uh, if your book is not all over the world translated into <laughs> fifty five hundred languages by the end of the year, um, <laughs> there's something going on. It is the best book. It is one. It is the best book I have felt and touched, let alone looked at, oh. um, probably in my entire life. Seriously, it is the best feeling book I think I've ever touched. I'm looking back oh. at my bookshelf bookshelf right now, thinking, is there anything I could compare it to? And there isn't. It is just the most unique book. And in an age where books are like cookie cutters, yes, you guys have defied the trend and just we done have. it remarkably. So you deserve so every single success that you get. It is a life changer, that book. Well, Thank pardon you. the pun, it is life changing <laughs> food, but it is a life changer. I absolutely love it. Oh, thank you. Well, let us introduce you. So for anyone who hasn't... Sure. Yes, anyone who hasn't met Marcus or heard him speak, uh, he's a speaker and mentor. He's the founder of Exceptional Life Br Blueprint. Oh, dear me, I'm getting my words mixed up today. And he's the CEO of The Wellness Couch. So this podcast is like one of uh, how many now? 20? How many? Oh, there's about 24. And there's 24. a few more even coming too. Like the Ooh. network is generally really always expanding. But, um, you know, there's so many interests in health and wellness. But, yeah, I think we're probably up to 23, 24 That's awesome. uh, shows across the network. On the wellness couch. And um, you, how many did you say like a, there's over 1.5 million downloads per year of the podcasts now? Yeah, it's probably even bigger than that. But that's yeah. generally at last check. I don't, I'm not a big fan of checking stats yeah, with podcasts because, Just go yeah, with it. <laughs> you know, yeah, because people get their, they get their highs and their lows from yeah. what number they are on the charts or what the downloads are. And I'm like, I don't think that's the reason why we podcast. It's no. um, a lot of ego attached to charts and downloads. Yeah, and right. so I just don't look at it. But that, that is generally the number that know, we generally talk about. With Fuad and I, we just enjoy um, chatting and interviewing people so much that I think if no one was listening, we'd still be having fun, wouldn't we, Fuad? <laughs> Well, I, I, I always am amazed when people say, oh, I love your podcast. I'm like, you listen to my yeah. podcast? <laughs> like, I actually think I'm just talking to a microphone just to have a conversation with Joe. And uh, it's, it always amazes me that that Well, happens. funny funny story. This is off tangent but kind of on. I was at the uh, <laughs> Sydney airport the other day and I was looking for my rental car, kind of just doing laps around Sydney airport as you do. It's so big. Yeah. And um, some guy just walks across the path and he goes, the wellness couch, the wellness couch, the wellness couch. Woo! And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, um, awesome. and that is it's far, that is way more awesome than checking how many yeah. downloads you got or what number on the charts you are and I, you know the algorithms behind all that stuff blows my mind I don't get it anyway so um, yeah. I think it's just better yeah dealing with listeners that that enjoy the impact that podcasts have on people's lives and and they are truly impactful things yeah. so yeah no, you, it's great to be part of the network isn't it and you live in Byron Bay you've got I do three kids now yeah. and a lovely lovely wife three named Sarah kids. Who they love their life changing food. Oh, Maya Darby that's and good Chompy. to hear. Sam <laughs> um, cooks 99% of the life changing food in the Pierce household. But um, <laughs> yes, it's, uh, it's yes, we're, we, we love our life up here. Born and raised in Melbourne, but uh, moved up to Byron just over three years ago. And oh, I reckon it's nice one of the, the best, one yeah, of the best decisions we've ever made in one of the best parts of the world, absolutely. Oh, that's good. Um, do you want to give us a little bit of a background on? why you got started with um, spreading wellness around the world. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, it was I know you were a journalist, I weren't you? 
Yeah, well, I always thought I would spread sport around the world. That's really what I thought my life was was um, meant for. And and for many, yeah, and for many years it was. It was for from the age of probably seven or eight to the age of twenty five. I was just consumed by sport. And I, I don't, you know, we didn't have a TV in the house, and the kids Ooh, get a bit of you know YouTube and all the rest of it. Yeah, and but, but I, I'd be stuffed if I didn't have a TV growing up. Like mm. I just that was like my reason for the being best. in terms of sport. You know, like mm. I'd be up till all. I was watching sport and that was a, a major thing for me in my career. When Sarah and I first met, the challenge was on weekends that, you know, I would not have to watch the footy, but that was what I said. I had to watch the footy because I worked at the footy show, the AFL footy show, and if I didn't know what was going on, then yeah. it was very hard for me to do my job. So um, as much as, you know, I loved that life, I did realize at some point that, um, you know, entertaining a million Australians every week through football was, I loved it, but I didn't feel like, it, I think I grew out of it. And having yeah. met Sarah when I was 23, 24, who is a chiropractor, health professional, um, I'd done a lot of personal growth in my late teens, early 20s, but I still was a smoker and a drinker, like a binge drinker. I always conveniently skipped over the health sections when I was doing, <laughs> say, life-transforming content. Um and uh, and then I just decided that I didn't want to be – I was associate producer of the footy show and I looked at the executive producer who I love dearly, an incredible man, but I didn't want that lifestyle of the, the, the you know, 80, 90-hour work weeks, not mm. see much of the wife and kids, good pay packet but no real time to kind of enjoy it, so to yeah. speak. And, um, and it was that point that I decided to leave sports media and I knew that I would transition into – personal growth and health and wellness media i didn't know how it would happen and it took about seven years really to between say leaving the footy show and then and then moving into the wellness couch and starting podcasts and the rest but i knew it would happen and eventually it did and mm. um yeah and then started 100 not out podcast with damien christoph after Thank a major you. epiphany in my life about 2012 and yeah all went from you've there interviewed, you've interviewed both of us on that one haven't you Oh yeah, interviewed. Yep, I think I interviewed. We interviewed you, Joe, in the early ago, days. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, well, by the time this interview comes out on a quirky journey, your interview on 100 on Out uh, will have been released yeah. too. Um, so, but I think, um, yeah, I think, I mean, just you know, I just I find I do find. I mean, I love sport, but I love it more as a hobby, as a, just as, as an interest. But I just, I am just enamored with health and wellness and personal growth and just living a great life. I could, you know, we we're talking about, you know, what we'd cover on this episode. I know the three of us could sit down in a cafe from 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. <laughs> Even if we didn't eat or drink a thing, we could just sit around and talk about life all day. It's yeah. that that type of um energy that that you know that life has. That yeah, I just love talking about, particularly with like minded people like you too. Yeah. Marcus, um, before we get into the, the bigger picture, let's start down the path of food because this is sort of where we focus on, um, but then we'll, we'll take it uh, as a larger view. So um, you used to be a vegan, is that mm. right? I was, I was. And before I was a vegan, I was very much that typical Australian diet. But then Sarah and I did um, a Tony Robbins event back in 2005 and we did a 10-day challenge going vegetarian. You know, up until that point, I was, you know, Vegemite on toast and mint slices for breakfast <laughs> oh. for morning tea and, you know, just barbecue shapes for afternoon tea and Vegemite sandwiches for lunch. And That sounds like a vegan diet to me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I, think I just mentioned I it was pretty much some... vegan or vegetarian, wasn't it? Um, but uh, me, then, I, w I was a vegetarian for a year. Yeah. Yep. There yeah. you go. But then, I think I think we decided to do. You know, we were we were fresh in our relationship back in 2005. We kind of started going out January 17, I reckon, 2005, and um, so we were fresh by the time we did this in September, October, and um, you know, 10 days, we felt great. Um, and then uh, 30 days uh, we decided to extend it out to being vegetarian and then we felt fabulous, uh, both of us. So we just decided as a team that we would continue down the vegetarian path and then um, and then that grew into being vegan and then that grew into quitting alcohol and then that went on till probably 2012, I reckon. Um, and it was a wonderful, wonderful you know thing. I'm, I'm so glad that we, we both did it, but I'm also very glad that we both um, – transitioned out of it as well i think it was a great chapter of, of my life mm -hmm. um but i'm also 
you know, I learned some pretty big things and, and I'm again, I'm so glad. And speaking to a lot of other people, I know Cindy O'Meara was veg or vegetarian for 10 or 12 years, Damien Christoph as well. A lot of people wow. in health and wellness have gone down that path um, and some have stayed in it and that's great, but there's also many that have decided that it's a good chapter and that chapter is allowed to finish as well. I never managed more than two days a week. <laughs> Veg- well, vegetarian. Yeah, I used to try and do two vegetarian days a week to try and, you know, keep the meat low and it it always, you know, like you say, it feels really good, all those cleansing vegetables and um, I think it's a really great way to give yourself a good detox but I mm. found it for my body type and for how I need to eat, it was very difficult to keep up. Well, I was talking about this briefly with, with Brett Hill. I've just been I'm midway through um, uh, Mahatma Gandhi's autobiography, mm-hmm. and he was talking about the rise of vegetarianism in the 1920s, 1930s, okay. and it was never – designed to be for the enjoyment of food it was it, it was well the way the rise of vegetarianism was based on a moral argument yes. rather than because you enjoy the food and a you know, big part of our society and I, I would generally like to think a big part of being a human being is that food is there to bring people together and yeah. food is there to be enjoyed and um totally and I, I i do feel that i probably lost the love of food in my in my vegan days like and, that, and other people i know i mean adele mcconnell veggie head is yeah. my, probably my most favorite vegan in the whole wide world yeah, she's, she's a wonderful human being and she loves vegan but what i love about adele is that she's not like so um what's the word like hard-headed that Mm. that the whole world should be vegan and you're a bad person if you're not and you're you know um immoral if you eat meat you know her husband eats meat you know like all the rest of it she got no problem with it but her whole philosophy is just eating more vegetables or eating more plant-based food and i think as you mentioned earlier joe that's that's what i think is ideal about the vegan diet is uh, just just like a paleo diet or many others is that it is plant-based the the foundation of the diet mm. is that plant-based food is um is important mm. i found when i went vegetarian for a year it started off really good and then um i would get too hungry so my mainstay was cheese sandwiches i was a really yeah. really bad vegetarian it's <laughs> interesting isn't it? it yeah yeah and, and you know um, the proteins and fats fill you up more than carbs and it's very hard to get that quality protein and uh, i mean you get your fats as a veggie but i do find it yeah you're hungry all the time yeah Yeah, and for someone who actually turned out to be insulin resistant like using grains and legumes as um the fillers in your food wasn't a good idea for me it was it was really quite a bad thing and later on when i went on paleo and switched to around my macronutrients it really helped but um i think vegetarianism is a is a great diet if it's done well veganism actually we don't have any kind of uh, uh, primitive cultures or uh, traditional cultures that have ever been vegan this is not a document thing as uh, you know in human societies around the world so it's, it's actually a very new thing there's only been a mention about veganism sometime around a thousand years ago there was one mention and i think it took around uh, 700 years before there was another mention historically about veganism yeah. and then the vegan society started but it's, it's one of um, it's a diet for people who um who are affluent like it's not a it's not a diet for hunting gatherers or people who are living off the land usually uh, to be vegan so you have to be very very capable of sourcing a lot of vegan food to be able to survive and quite often um, nature doesn't provide just vegan food for you like you have to be able to survive you have to eat eggs and honey and meat and things like that if you're out there in the wild so you know as a as a general way of living veganism is, is quite hard unless you live in a world that can can provide you with that kind of food um and if it's done well, then some people do well on it. I found it very, very difficult to be vegetarian. Mm. But that, yeah. I wasn't well, dedicating you, my life to it. That conversation we had on 100 Not Out when you were talking about this very thing, the whole ancestral eating approach, um, was it got Damo and I, we had big chats after the, the episode just on what you were talking about. And it is interesting that there's there's very little historical um Evidence is not a word I like to use, but it's very hard to find, yeah, as you said, cultures of people that have thrived on a vegan diet. Well, there are none. They don't yeah. exist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is, this is the like the big argument that, that I have with vegans, uh, not in a negative way, but like um, 
the way that I like to view things is through an ancestral perspective, because I know that these diets that our ancestors have eaten for thousands of years have been tried and tested, mm. that they actually work and they provide good health. So if we were to look at a model of a diet and say that, yes, this is going to be a good one, it's going to have to be one that's been tried and tested. Yeah. Um, and yeah, veganism diet. might be, and it might t- take on a shape like in a, you know another two, three hundred years of veganism, people might get really get it and really be able to do a vegan diet that's very, very healthy. And that would be amazing because that would mean we're not actually killing all the animals and things like that. But, um, you know, that's, well, the, that's the unfortunate is, side effect of eating, uh, being an omnivore, I guess. That's the other thing, though, is that, you know, food is such a social, and if you think of culture and, and, and cultures that we talk about, like food is, a, is one thing that brings people together. And I know one challenge that we really had when we were vegan is that it actually separates you from people. So whether it's family yes. trying to work out what to cook yeah. for you or friends so that true. don't necessarily want to bring you over because they don't really know what to make for you, it's not rude or mean, but you find a lot of... A lot of people that are vegan find it really hard to have the same quality of social lives and and family relationships that they once did because of the choice. And and you can kind of understand it as you talk about it through that, you know, in the past, it's very difficult to find any cultures, we don't think there are, that actually thrived on a vegan diet. Because if you imagine trying to bring people together on that, it would have been very difficult. Oh, you know, I just think of Ireland. You know, Sarah and I lived in Ireland for a year and it's like, let's all gather around for some cabbage and potatoes. Um it's it's is it's tricky to do on a sustainability uh, basis, particularly with the winds of the seasonal changes and everything else. So mm. it's a fascinating Absolutely. conversation. Like, I mean, if you if you were like um, out there in the wild and you were hungry and you came across honey, you're not gonna be like, oh, I can't eat yep. honey. You know, you're gonna smash yep. it. And like the same thing with fish and <laughs> any Have you animal guys that seen- you can hunt. Have you seen the movie, um, it's got Dev Patel in it, about the boy on the boat, um, The Life of Pi? Yes, that's a great movie. Yeah, so you remember when he was grew up vegetarian and yeah. had real challenges with eating meat and then he got stuck out on the boat and then the fish, like he's yeah, calling right. for God for like something to keep him alive yeah. and the flying fish start coming out and literally smashing him in the body yeah. and <laughs> yeah. he goes through this whole turmoil of like, of eating another animal, but then he's so grateful and just giving thanks for it. And it's a really, I find it a fascinating, um, yeah, just insight into the what it takes to be uh, not just a human being, but the, the connection that we have to it, the food and the soul and what it represents for us and, and the internal struggle that a lot of us these days, fortunately or unfortunately, there's a lot of internal struggle people have with the food that they eat. Mm-hmm. Um and I think, yeah, as you're kind of referring to food that a thousand years ago, there probably wasn't the same level of internal struggle. If you saw honey, you ate honey. Yes. You didn't start wondering, yeah. well, is it an animal product or is it not? Or what does it come from? And exactly. how has it been processed? And oh my gosh, what are people going to think? And am I vegan or am I not vegan if I have this honey? And what will my friends <laughs> think? And oh my there gosh. Wasn't you know. labels. <laughs> no, there was just, and there's not so much brain space and um, almost like mental exhaustion that goes into yeah. food. Yeah. Which, um, is a tricky game, but, but also that gratitude aspect that, that's that's something we've lost uh, mm. entirely as a society, not just you know, depending on what you eat, but um, because we're so divorced from the uh, food manufacturing process. I'm talking about yeah. like slaughterhouses and all that kind of stuff. We, we, we're sheltered away from the, the death of the animals, so what we buy is just a packet of meat that's um, you know, gassed and wrapped in plastic and ready for us to take. We don't associate it with anything that um, that is living, and uh, we don't have the gratitude for it so we, we lose an aspect of our humanity there um but um talking about that um the the aspect that you mentioned earlier about um, reaching uh, people um through food like, and connecting the with people through food can you talk a little bit more about that because i know that you focus on that a lot like social lives and diets and um, how they interrelate and what what a healthy diet and healthy social life looks like. So can you elaborate a bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think, again, I think people have become so fixed on what to eat. I remember interviewing, do you remember we did that interview on the Right Diet Summit? Yeah. You know, we were talking about... Mm. Um, we we're talking about gaps and we we're talking about Isaac and the rest. Yeah. And then I remember interviewing Pete Evans and I was thinking, I asked most people, what would your last meal be? And, and Pete Evans said, oh, and I was shocked but really loved the answer. He said, well, it doesn't matter what I eat. It's it's who I eat it with and how I eat it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and that was just, uh, that that for me was, was a massive, you know, just like just a reminder that, 
you know, the food, a lot of people are so fixed on what's on the table yes. that they forget who they're eating it with. And yeah. Joe, you may remember, you guys might remember from the summit last year, there was a woman, I still remember there was an attendee there who was like, you know, my mum, you know, has me over for dinner every month and, you know, she makes me a spaghetti bolognese and <laughs> I don't, I don't, you know, like, it it's kind of goes against, you know, all of my food philosophies. Yeah. And, uh, you, you know, we were saying that 12 meals a year out of the yes. – unless, she, unless she's on a healing diet and she's celiac or she needs mm. gaps or she needs something, but I don't think she did. It was like 12 meals a year that connect you and your mum together for an opportunity yeah. to develop and grow your relationship out of the 2,000 meals a year that you would probably eat. Yeah. Um, are we are, are, do we are we beginning to lose the sight of of what food represents? Like it's not it's not always. I mean, a lot of the time it is what we eat, but we get as human beings living our lives these days, we get to control most of our food. Like we can choose what we make for breakfast. You know, it's pretty much eggs and greens in our house. It's we can choose what we have most of the time if we're buying seasonal, local, organic whole foods. If someone's going to invite us over once a month and cook us a meal, yeah. uh, and we get to engage and socialize with them and 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 feel the great attitude of human connection and all of those mm-hmm. things, I believe those experiences far outweigh what's on the plate. And a lot of the research, I know there's some wonderful research from Harvard that, you know, um, studied 5,000 Californians, uh, which is which is well known for its, its health consciousness over there on the West Coast. And they looked at their social lives um, and their diets. And the people with the greatest social lives outlived the people with the greatest diets. Yeah. But the people that had the great social lives and the great diets Live the longest. Mm, the people that had great sense. diet but poor social lives, where they might be eating their chicken salad, but they're all alone by themselves. They've got no friends. They're not engaging in their marriage. They don't like their job. They're you know not doing well financially or whatever. Does yeah. it really matter what you eat if you're not honouring those other areas of life? Yeah. And that's where I think we've kind of lost sight of the true meaning of um of food. I think it's so interconnected with our spirit, our soul, and our relationships that we need to bring it back to that. So oh. true. Yeah. yeah, like talking about that person who, who struggles with eating with her mother. And this this is one of those things that at a subconscious level as well, there are issues of acceptance there where like she, she wants her mom to accept her for what she's doing and they'll go through all these things. And I think like um, if you go into food with a bit more of a relaxed attitude, it brings healing to your relationships as well rather than putting out conditions and boundaries between yourself and the person who's offering you food. Yeah. And it, it just takes gives you another step forward in your life so that there's a bit more positive there rather than just the hang-ups that you usually are faced with in usual situations and just becomes an excuse for having a fight as, as well you know and, yeah, you and avoidance some, you see some people who are so almost angry about anyone mm. offering them something or their children something that they shouldn't have or they feel um, slighted if their mom offers their kids an icy pole yeah. like they get and visibly it, upset rather yeah and they don't want they don't like hanging around with their friends anymore because their friends all eat differently or whatever i just feel like i've always um obviously when we were doing strict gaps intro we had to be very careful and we took food with us wherever we went but we always offered to share it so there was still that relationship thing happening with the food and i always as you, you guys know i always made sure it was yummy so they'd want to eat it <laughs> And that's, I think we've that's done what makes that. you so yeah. good, Jojo. All your food tastes awesome. <laughs> oh, well, that, I think we've really Well, that, that's a good point, that. Joe. Like, at least share from what you can yeah, have. Yeah, that's you know, right. That, that and adds so a bit of conviviality into That's right. I would make extra and put it out so that, especially when it's a shared table, it's not so, um, uh, what's the word? Um, you know, you're not sort of making a big difference between what you eat and they eat. You're just putting it all out and then you just yeah. – your kids – well, my kids know, um, you know, when they were on gaps what they could and couldn't eat and they would just pick from what was on the table. And there was always things they could have. I would make sure of that. Um, and then anyone yeah. else could share as well. And I think like my mum, we'd go over there. My mum's famous for her fried chicken being from Texas and um, – Every time she has visitors, they request fried chicken. So she started making a GAPS version for us. So that was her trying to show her love. And, you know, nowadays. Oh, I love your mum. Yeah. I love your mum. <laughs> nowadays, I would probably, if she made fried chicken with wheat flour, um, I might be able to have a little bit now, um, but I would definitely not go overboard. But it's just like you say, I think it's a now and then thing. As long as you're not trying to heal, you're not celiac, you're not allergic to something to have something now and then to show love is an important thing. 
I think if, yeah, that's the important thing, isn't it? Like if you've got like, you know, they always, well, I often talk about the example is when I was vegan, it was like if I had cancer and my doctor told me that I had to go vegan, no one would bat an eyelid. No. Because then we'd be like, well, the doctor said that's what you do, that's what you do. That's right. But if I chose to do it myself, people start judging and making up names and labels mm. and all types of things. And I think, you know, your example is spot on is that if you don't want or if you have a particular choice, I think it's in the way that we communicate our choices oh, that's so rather true. than getting upset with people. Yeah. Just say, look, like I'm not I'm not here to cause a bother. I'm just I don't eat wheat. Like yeah. I'm not it's it doesn't it doesn't matter, you know what I mean? Mm. Um but other people feel slighted, don't they? Because mm. they, they feel rejected when you, if we don't choose to eat their food. And I always remember growing up with Italian friends, it'd be like, oh, you always eat my mum's food because if you don't eat my mum's food, then yeah, she gets angry <laughs> and all the rest of it. You know, so I can kind of see where it comes from. And I think that that's very, if you think of, say, evolution, that would have been definitely the way it is. But the 2017 version means we need to really know thyself and have that, that gumption or that strength of self to go, really are so grateful that you've made this food. If I have it, though, I'm going to blow up and... Yeah. Um, have, I've just got yeah. a challenge in my gut. So, you know, I've brought along this and, and I'll have that instead. But I think it's the way we communicate. Exactly. Because that's where a lot of people fall down is they find themselves in emotional, angry, frustrated places just because they have not mastered the art of communicating their needs to other people. Yeah. And just like making sure that you show love back by sharing what you can. Yeah. So I think that yeah. that really changes the whole thing. Spot on. Spot on. Um, I'd like to uh, maybe shift gears a bit and talk about the exceptional life blueprint a bit more specifically. Um, sure. You have uh, a pyramid for um, the ELB. Is that, is that how That's you call it? Yeah, we just because yeah, as Joe said at the beginning, exceptional life blueprint is a bit of a tongue twister. <laughs> yeah, you so try and say it ELB, three times really fast. Gets, yeah, <laughs> we get down to ELB pretty quickly because it's just a bit shorter and easier. <laughs> um, so, so it's uh, you, you represent it as a as a pyramid with eight layers and um, the, at the bottom of the pyramid there's life purpose and you talk about um, getting people to do what they love and love what they do and um, I was uh, looking at my life recently and uh, I've had a strange one I've uh, <laughs> gone through like I've changed countries and uh, changed many careers and I, I struggled with redefining purpose and it wasn't even um, after I finished writing the cookbook, I was still struggling with that. And it wasn't until earlier this year that it dawned on me what my life purpose was. And it was um, to, f to feed people. Mm -hmm. And I understood that my life purpose is to provide people food to eat and also information to consume around food and nutrition to bring them to health and back to a connection with their true nature. And it Yours took me is also kidding. food for the soul, though, Fuad. I mean, when people listen to you, we are enamored yeah. by you. I think that's what so it means, food. food people both yeah. ways, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, just to, to allow, give people nutrition on all aspects of their life. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that, that was really where, where I found my purpose. But it took me 37 years to sort of realize that that's what I've already been doing. Mm. Yep. But I've actually I've, I've been doing that and I didn't yeah. know that until the realization came to me yeah. so um, I want to talk a bit more about that and to understand from your perspective how, how do you get people to find out what their life purpose is because quite well, often we're so confused with everyday life we don't know where we are and we don't know where we're going I've asked people what their passion is and they can't name it how do you help yeah. people find that out well, I think your example is a, is, a, is a perfect example is that you constantly ask yourself the question. So, first of all, it's bringing that awareness is, well, am I doing what I love and loving what I do? And, and at, and at the, um, the event, I actually get people to write down, what, are you, what do you love to do? And then I also get them to write down, what did you do today? And the two lists, if they're not similar, then it's quite clear that you're not doing what you love and loving what you do. But once you have that awareness, which it sounds like you had, um, Fu, that you, you weren't necessarily doing it, then you begin to really question, well, what is it that I'm here to do? It's that constant questioning. The brain will come up with answers. Our heart and soul will come up with answers only when we ask questions. And a lot of people just aren't asking the question, or am I doing what I love? Listen. Yeah, or taking the time to listen. That constant nagging the soul will give us to to recognize that something is not fulfilling us. But the other element, which doesn't get spoken about enough, 
which again, you're a perfect example of, Phil, is that you remained a beautiful human being through the process of looking for clarity on what you wanted to do with your life. So a lot of people will go, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. But it's also like, well, who are you here to be? Like, what's mm-hmm. your personality? Are you living what Wayne Dyer coined the four cardinal traits? Are you being respectful of people? Are you being kind? Are you generous in nature? Are you of service to other people? It doesn't really matter what you do when you when you bring mm-hmm. those those traits to life. Um, who cares if you can't stand your job? If someone's crossing the road and they and their plastic bag full of goodies, you know, um, um, collapses, you go and help them. You know, who cares how fulfilled or unfulfilled mm-hmm. you are in your work or how your day's gone so far i think the more we come from who are we here to be then the doing begins to unfold and begins to become clearer um if we're courageous enough to ask questions and and i think your example is spot on um for like you became quite what i would say determined to get clarity around the answer and and i think people really respond to my message and and do the work when they're really clear to to find the answer. But I'm very big on, we are hyper focused on the doing side of Mm -hmm. things that good old, you know, we're not human doings, we're human beings. A lot of us are focused on what am I here to do? But it's really, who am I here to be? That is the first question that we want to answer. Mm. Um, It brings to mind uh, Joseph Campbell. I'm not sure if you've read any of his work. I haven't read his books. No, I've really just seen his quotes and and read bits and pieces of him. He's a, an amazing person. Um, he was a comparative mythologist, so he looked at mythologies from all around the world. And um, he he recognized that there is a common mythology to all cultures. And um, he called it the hero's journey. And he wrote a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And yes. um, the, the reason why he called it that is it's the same hero that appears in all of history and all of our cultural mythology. And it, uh, it's the same story. But with a thousand faces and um you know it's sort of an arc arc or a circle that the whole thing goes through the 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 hero's journey but in the beginning there's a call for the human being They, they feel that there's a call for them to pursue something and um the calling never stops un- like, until it gets unbearable and they, they continue to refuse it. And they never find true happiness until mm. they go down that path. And it's a path of adventure and danger and growth and all that kind of stuff. And at the end, you know, throughout the journey, like they'll meet uh, people, for instance, that they become their friends and they have um, their support while they're fighting the wars. Or they meet a big teacher and the teacher gives them some kind of special power or something like that. But at the end, they have to face the biggest enemy and they have to face the enemy alone. And um, this is sort of a, a metaphor for life where we have to walk our own path and really follow these uh, these callings that we have. Otherwise, we won't really find happiness in ourselves. And a lot of uh, symbology, for instance, like the dragons or um, the, the, the evil people, in mythology, they're the ones who didn't follow the, their calling. And um, it's sort of like a historically what uh, our ancestors are telling us is when the calling comes, you have to follow it. So this is a, a beautiful thing that you've put that down at the bottom of your pyramid for life purpose and to talk about that as a, as a foundation for your life because everything goes yeah. on top of it. Everything um, goes on top of it. If, if you don't nail that, then everything else feels like a silver medal mm. and it's that good old one-liner in sport, like no one remembers who won the silver medal at the Olympics. Um, <laughs> you always feel like you just have got a, a major missing piece in your heart. Uh, you really have got me wanting to go and read that, that book now. I'm going to go and get that, The Hero's Journey. Oh, it's um, fantastic. Yeah. You, but, you can also, there's a Spotify uh, playlist of hours, like something like 27 hours of uh, Joseph Campbell doing lectures. And uh, my language. It's, really, oh, it's so good. It's so good. Listen to that one. And then you can move on to Put the that book, one in the show yeah. notes. Joseph Campbell on Spotify. Yeah. Oh, okay. So good. Um, so, so what's the next tier up from Life Purpose? So, yeah, the foundation, as you said, is Life Purpose. And what, what I've observed in, in humanity, again, I still can't find a a, a vegan centenarian, so to speak. But what we do find is that they all move. People that live a great long life, and right now we're talking about longevity or, or quantity of life, is that they, 
they have a regular lifestyle of movement. And the one liner is when I'm asking people to assess movement in life is is movement a lifestyle chore or a lifestyle choice? And you look at all cultures. Um, whilst they may not have used the same word as as a lifestyle choice, it would have been well, my life depends on moving. Like if I don't go out to find food, then my family doesn't survive. It would, but the the key is, is that movement is built into their lifestyle mm. whereas now for us in 2017 movement is a luxury item you know yeah. we stand for about 20 to 30 minutes a day on average you know when i ask people how wow. often is how much time do you spend standing you know the, the average in terms of research is 73 minutes but that research is four to five years old wow. if you ask people these days anecdotally some people will say 25 30 35 minutes and you know we want to be talking about moving our bodies for 30 35 minutes a day at minimum um whereas a lot of people they just need just to be cooking that. more because then you can be walking around yep. the kitchen, see? <laughs> but that's a perfect example, though. A lot of people are not even in the kitchen that's true. to do it. They're getting drive Take through. Or, they're getting their yeah. takeaway. They're having home deliveries. Frozen meals um, from the grocery store. Frozen meals. Look, I'm a massive fan of sitting at the dinner table. I yes, reckon people too. go, oh, sitting is a new smoking. Well, sitting at the dinner table or the breakfast table or the lunch table is the best form of sitting uh, with others, engaging. And, and again, all of the cultures that I've observed, they sit whilst they eat. They're not walking on their phone, having three conversations and mm-hmm. all the rest of it. They are sitting engaged with their meal and then they're conversing with the people that they're eating with. Mm. But a lot of the other sitting is just all um, – is, is based <laughs> on the lifestyles that we've created for ourselves, yeah. cars and transport and computers mm. and all the other things, and that's where I think we need to be somewhat more vigilant. Can I just mention something here? Um, my good friend Emma is a remedial therapist and Pilates instructor and she's been working with us in our retreats and she was mentioning that, um, you know, the rage became, okay, sitting st- not good for you, so we'll do standing desks. She said they are actually causing problems now because people are just standing in one position. So it is all about movement. It's not whether Blow it's back. Yeah, yeah, it's totally. not whether it's sitting or standing. It's moving. So yeah, people are putting treadmills yeah. into their office yeah. so that they're walking whilst they're standing. I think I need that. And they're working. <laughs> I think I'd fall over. I think yeah, I'd, I'd get probably. so enamoured with my work, I'd forget to walk. Yeah, They'd be that's like, oh. true. I would then too. I'd break my computer because I'd fall <laughs> down and then you'd be like, oh, my gosh, what was I doing? But she um, says, you know, but the get interesting up thing every is with 30 movement, minutes and move around a bit. Uh, yeah, totally. Mm. Yep, I'm with you. But we are now paying a massive consequence for this lack of movement. 42%, this was a stat shared by Professor Michael Woodward on 100 Not Out, who's uh, in, he's on the Alzheimer's Australia board. 42% of all dementia would be gone if we moved sufficiently. We could pretty much cut dementia in half wow. if we were sufficiently physically active. And that's coming from a medically trained um, professor in, in Alzheimer's mm. um, talking about brain health and its connection to movement and the other the other big factors are our social lives and our brain activity but our brain activity is strong when we're doing what we love you know we're problem solving we're working in spite if we don't like our work then our brain activity is slow we've got brain fog we find it hard to concentrate because we just really don't want to engage with the work um you know, so I think it's just it, there are major consequences to mediocrity in these areas of our life, and and the movement one for me is, is one of the worst. Dementia would have to be the worst way to go, if if you ask oh, yeah. me. Yeah, I agree. Um, you've uh, coached so many people around these areas in your life. Um, how like how do people respond? Like how do, when people uh, recognize the mediocre areas in their life, what's the general response there? And how, how do they come to it? Is it something that makes them happy? Do they feel upset with themselves? What, what are the usual Yeah, I'm always you- very cautious just to remind people that you're not a bad person if you have mediocre areas of your life. Like I think we always have areas of our life which we're wanting to improve on. That's just, a, no, we, that's just the nature of the beast. We are, we are designed to grow. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and there is there's always an area that will be your Achilles heel, which will be the one where when stuff happens, that that might be likely to um, slip back into mediocrity. But the thing is having that awareness, and then as mm-hmm. you suggested with your say life purpose evolvement earlier, um, Foo, is it is it when you become truly aware that say you're not fulfilled in an area of life or it's mediocre. If you can attach it to enough uh, pleasure or, say, avoidance of pain, you know, like for me, I move largely because the last thing I want to put my kids and family through is dementia. Like I will be filthy on myself if I was told that I could cut my risk of dementia in half if I moved regularly and then in my 60s or 70s 
or 80s, I got diagnosed with dementia. And then my wife is looking after me and my kids are looking after me and all the money that mm. I'd kind of been working so hard to accumulate is being spent on just keeping me alive for what purpose? I mean, that just that just drives me to move my body regularly because I, I look at my life ahead, you know, three, four, five, six decades, which not many of us do because we live such an urgent world. But I reckon if, if you know, if we all lived with a bit more foresight, um, you know, the rock chair test so to speak put yourself on a rocking chair in your 80s or 90s and reflect on your life that would be some of the biggest consequences that i, I wouldn't want to experience so um uh, people generally find it confronting but if people are ready and generally a lot of the top people i'm speaking to they are they're into personal growth but even if they're not like i spoke to a bunch of property investors around australia in april who aren't necessarily all that interpersonal growth, but some of them had major, major epiphanies in terms of their work and why they were investing in property and what impact it would have if they had all the property, but they never had the health or the family relationships to enjoy it. So it's that that paradigm shift of recognizing that there's more than one area of life to master and the consequences are quite dire if we don't uh, at least make the effort to rise to magnificence in each of these eight areas. Because um, again, if you get your whole life sorted out, but you stuff up your money or you stuff up your relationships it doesn't matter the success of those other areas counts for naught in the end mm. because the consequences are, are pretty um, shambolic um you have a an event coming up in melbourne uh, it, it coincides with our gut health retreat so I'll, i won't be able to make it this time but yeah. thanks for the invite <laughs> oh uh, well, and, and i was just saying before the interview it's a little bit sad that it's on the same weekend because a lot of us would like to do both <laughs> <I know. laughs> that's okay we'll have more um, retreats and you'll have more for of your sure. and, we'll, and i'll have more events <laughs> i was lucky to have you in byron for the very first elb live yeah back it was in really good now that you're talking about this i'm remembering um i'm remembering the talks and the notes that i took and i should go over them and again your dear really grandmother good. had just passed away That's and you right. shared about your exceptional things grandmother that I, things that i'd learned from my grandmother yeah yeah um, absolutely so with with the event like i'm sure that part of it's going to be about helping people identify these areas of mediocrity in their life uh, can you yeah. give us a bit of a taster on or some kind of tool maybe that would help our listeners to start identifying these areas before they start yeah, before they come sure. over to the to the event and, yeah absolutely uh, come and see absolutely you. Well, there's a couple of things. What, I, what I'll do is I'm very happy to share a, a video series which helps people identify of those eight areas, where are they now? Because you're right, Fu, you've got to find out where are you now to define mm. where is it that you want to go. So um, let's make sure we share that to the a Quirky Journey tribe. Um, great. Thanks. But then, no, no worries. But then once that's identified, and, and, and uh, yeah, yes, I do do that at the beginning of the event, the first you know 90 minutes of the event is about finding out where you are now. And then the remainder of the event is going through each of the eight areas, the life purpose, the movement, the social life, nutrition, love and relationships, growth, wealth, and spirit. Um, and then we do some productivity in there as well. So you can really identify how to incorporate this into your life. Because as you said, it's no mean feat, but it's definitely something that is, it's easier than it sounds, I must say, because a lot of people can can really have this nailed. But um, we go through over the course of those two days, um, helping people not just get clear, but to give people the confidence um, and the clarity to, to transform each of those eight areas. So they leave the event really confident that they can actually do it and knowing what to do because I think that's that's the important step is not just knowing that you can do it but also knowing what to do. We do need some practical steps to, yeah. to move through it. So that's really the purpose of the event is to give people clarity and then to give them the confidence, the self-belief and also the network. I mean, you know, there's always 100 plus mm. people at these events to really give people a network of um, of friends and, and people that understand them and, and then we put everyone in a Facebook group so they can kind of just share their victories that they might not feel comfortable sharing or on their own pages or with their own circle of friends and and that i think is a really big thing and joe you know you'd see this yeah, in the in definitely. the chat groups that you have you know they yeah. might not share it on their personal pages but within that chat group of people that understand them they feel like they can be open it. yeah yeah i think that's really important yeah Marcus, th this is a, an area that really interests me because I, I notice in myself um, when people start talking about areas of self-improvement, um, I, I switch into like a, a cognitive dissonance mode where uh, my, my uh, immediate reaction would be to uh, resist change and that would come in the form of some kind of skepticism or negativity towards what is being asked of me to, to look at or something like that. I, yeah. um, I don't 
uh, easily open up to myself in an honest way. And it's something I've worked on in myself over the years to, to improve, to be honest to myself um, and to allow myself um, this ability to really look at what's going on within me. But um, I, I bet that that's a more common problem than I think it is. It's not just me who feels that. Is that correct? Or is, oh, you, yeah, you... great point. Really, really good point, Fu. I think it's a wonderful thing that you've raised. I think we, all of us have an inbuilt protectionism to safety <laughs> and comfort that that identifies that change uh, can sometimes be bad. And I think change sometimes can be bad, particularly when it's a change that other people project on us. And that is one of the biggest regrets of humanity is that I wish I'd lived my life according to my own expectations rather than the expectations of others. You know, mm-hmm. so, you know, you hear people say, well, I was a teacher because my dad told me I'd be a teacher. Or I, was in a doc- I was a doctor or accountant because that's what my parents told me that I should be. I think change, true change, and again, referring back to your example earlier, Fu, about your your clarity around life purpose, when it comes from within, where you create the definition for what it is that you want to change within your own life, and bringing in those character traits of clarity, but courage as well, having the courage to shift, even when you know it, it might be tough. You talk about that hero's journey, Fu, like that comes from within. The hero doesn't come because their mum or dad says they should, or their teacher says mm. they should, or their boss says they should. It's a calling that is almost like a magnetic pull. I talk about the, the difference between inspiration and motivation is inspiration is that magnetic pull, which you can't really do anything about. You can't really choose the podcast you listen to, the blogs you read, the topics you talk about. You kind of just feel pull to it whereas the motivation is one they when people go oh you should read this or you should go there or you should do that i mean that people don't want to do what other people tell us to no. do it's like as soon as you tell me that i should do it i automatically don't want to do it you automatically you know, when the mom it says, as go undesirable clean your room, undesirable when mum says go clean your room it's like well as soon as you told me to do it i don't want to do it but if i've got that standard within myself because mm-hmm. it's important to me and it's a positive reflection of me as a human being, then I'm more likely to do it. And so I think that's the shift is what's important to you and what's important to you and me is different to what's important to everyone else. And so, you know, my whole message is finding out what is exceptional to you, what is unique to you, what is important to you and when you can identify what is important to you. I mean, some people, like we're talking about movement, some people hate yoga. Yoga is this buzz movement that the world seems to be enamored by. But if you look at history and we talk about culture on this podcast, you know, the, the Indi- let's use, just be generic. The Indian mum and dads of this world of years gone by, they didn't do yoga because it was cool. They just did yoga because it was a spiritual experience that they wanted to do to keep them in line with their spirit and their soul and their faith. It wasn't like this buzz buzz thing. A lot of us are doing things because we see it on Facebook or Insta or Twitter saying, it's trendy. (laughs) Green juices are trendy. Yoga is trendy. Mindfulness is trendy. Mindfulness bothers me because so many people are trying to be mindful, but then they go home and they're rude to their spouse or their partner. They're short with their kids and then they're mindful for 10 minutes, you know, in a corner of a room, (laughs) but they don't make it a lifestyle choice or a, Uh, a choice of their soul. And there's that great line by Benjamin Frank. Franklin, when you realize what little, what you, when you realize how difficult it is you ch- to change yourself, you realize what little chance you have of changing others. Yeah. And so many people are wishing other people would change. I, I feel sad when I'm talking to a client and they go, "Oh, you know, I, I thought when I married my husband or husband or my wife that they would change." <laughs> And I was like, you, you actually thought the wedding would change the other person? <laughs> it, it doesn't work like that. But it's so common. Yeah. We often expect people to change. But it's when we nice. realize how hard it is for us to change, mm-hmm. then I think it's important we recognize that the moment we have no expectation on others, then I think the better our life is because it's so much easier to live yes. our life when we have little expectation of others because we can't control them. Oh, that, that helped me so much when I sort of figured that out in the last few years really to um, stop putting my expectations on others, um, yeah. you just become so much Thank more God. chilled. Oh. <laughs> you, <laughs> poor Ad, why aren't you working harder? <laughs> no. But can I yeah. just mention – ex- so go, go, you go first. 
No, I I used to expect Sarah to like love. So Sarah, we, part of our reason for moving up here was Sarah felt like an average Cairo and an average mum. And, you know, I'd say to Sarah sometimes when we had our chiropractic practice, like, can't you just switch off when you go to work? And she's like, no, like a mum doesn't switch off like Never. that. A mum <laughs> is not just like a typical male that can just go, right, I open the door and I'm a chiropractor and then I shut the door that's and right. then I'm a mum. We're not you know, very like, good at um, segregating things in our minds. Exactly. But that's, but that's a wide, that's that is a, innate. Like you yeah, cannot. You also cannot change thing. that. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was a massive thing for me when I did um, a lot of John Martini's work and the breakthrough experience. My big breakthrough was not expecting Sarah to change and not mm. expecting anyone to change because yeah. we're all wired in our own way. And the moment we lose that expectation on others, the easier everything else is. Oh, Even so just living easier. our own life is easier because we, yep. we just don't spend any mental energy expecting other people to change. Yeah, and that we yeah. realize how much exhaustion we kind of create mm-hmm. through that hope and expectation on others yeah um i just wanted to quickly mention something you touched on earlier um you mentioned about the urgency that we have in life and how it stops us from finding life purpose and all of that this is something i remember years ago i read a little book on um it was called the tyranny of the urgent and it's always stuck in my head but i don't always you know actually do it but um (laughs) just how you can get so bound up by every urgent thing that pops into your head who are <laughs> laughing at me because I do this all the time. Uh, I'm really bad uh, with this. And you don't look at the big picture and I think that's what most of us do. Um, well, maybe is it just women? I don't know. <laughs> Oh no! I think yeah. I think it's it's uh, it's it's just a, it's almost cool to be frantically busy, and it's uncool to be going with the flow and you know and yeah. relaxed. Yeah, I think. Um, the good thing about these retreats is you actually put all that urgent stuff aside and you and you can let go of it and then you can actually think about the long term the big picture you know what's really important um, you give your permission yourself permission to just stop all the urgent for a couple of days and i think well, that's I, I really think there's hardly ever anything urgent well that's, well, that's why you two work so well that's together right. i was going to say you are beautiful <laughs> yin and yang because <laughs> he, he just constantly so reminds me of this. I mean, the heart rate drops the moment yeah. you hear his sultry tones. It's true. Whenever uh, I get really, whenever I get Joe's really stressed, Joe's a little energizer bunny buzzing around. <laughs> whenever you know. I get really stressed out about something, I I talk to Fuad and he calms me down. I go, I just needed a Fuad chat. <laughs> yeah, oh, I get it. Yeah, and and Sarah's that for me. Like Sarah's yeah. the slow, and I'm the fast. And I think most relationships have that. And that's yeah. the thing. You couldn't switch it. You can't turn Fu into an urgency addict. And Jojo is not going to become some you know Buddhist Zen you know <laughs> monk anytime soon. Like it's not in your nature. And I think it's yeah. really important that we own our nature. Yeah. And you know, I think Joe, you and I have spoken about being an introvert in an extroverted world. Yeah. The world is so extroverted, mm. and you know. Um, so many people are, are introverts by nature, but they have to it kind of get out it, there. still be extra. Yeah, get out there, you know, but it's about having that awareness of who are you at your core and not denying that um, so that you don't, you know, go over the top. And I do think that whole know thyself in this game is, is absolutely vital because, again, otherwise you run out of gas. You run out mm. of steam, you burn out. You can't be someone else for too long nope. um, and it catches up with you. It does. We're coming up to an hour, Marcus, and uh, we could probably do another oh, two or three. We're only ten percent of the way through. Again, we could. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our last podcast was an hour and forty-five minutes. We better not do it again. <laughs> <laughs> We're just getting warmed up. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll definitely have Marcus again because this yeah. is fascinating and it's yeah, just the it kind is. of stuff we like talking about outside of just focusing on health and nutrition, but yeah. more of a holistic health approach to what it is to be a human being and how to live your life because you know we're not born with a manual next to us and uh, for sure our our parents (laughs) most of us haven't done a a great job in teaching us how to live this life because they haven't had the education themselves so uh, we're lucky to be in in this time um, in the world's history where information is uh, so available to us and we have such inspirational people who can teach us and help us navigate this tricky journey of life and enjoy it to uh, our maximum capacity one of those to tell people, us to so. chill out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, we all need a bit of food. We all need a bit of food time. <laughs> um, Marcus, uh, give, give us your final notes on when the event is and uh, how people can find out a bit more about it. 
Yeah, sure. So it's, uh, again, same weekend as you guys. So we were just saying, you know, pre-chat is really important because it's a bit awkward that we've got an event on the same weekend. But, you know, if <laughs> it's you... It's opposite if, ends if, of the country, though. Opposite ends of the country, and, and yeah, and as we're saying, different focuses on life. Like, yeah. don't come to ELB Life for gut health. Don't come for gut health. Don't come for renewing um, your health so much. I think if, if that's where you're at, you must go uh, and spend some time with Joe and Fu and friends um, up in far north Queensland. But if it's something that you're looking for a real life, uh, not an overhaul, but you really look, at, you want to kind of reset on life, um, mm-hmm. whether that's your life purpose and career, your relationships, your social life. Life. Yes, your health to a point, but also how that connects with those other areas of life and your wealth and your spirit, and really just how big you picture. how you um, yeah, big picture, and, and not just how you juggle it, but how you how you integrate it all into your life. If you're particularly a parent and you feel like you're spinning plates and you might find it really tricky to uh, make the time for your marriage and your friendships and all the rest of it, then this weekend has a a good blend of philosophy and practical help with other people to really um, help you kind of take that next step in your life. So it's June 3 and 4. It is um, at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre where we had the Wellness Summit um, last year. And there's a special quirky journey link it's melbourne.marcuspierce.com.au forward slash quirky that's melbourne.marcuspierce.com.au forward slash quirky and uh you know we'd love to have as many a quirky journey our listeners there as possible awesome fantastic yeah. thank you so much marcus yeah thank and, you uh, no worries, we'll, we'll see you soon you. Yeah. yeah, thanks for having me on. And um, I just forgot to mention there is a two-for-one special for Quirky Journey uh, Tribe as well. And Ooh. if there's people that are um, – I know you've got a few friends in uh, Melbourne, Joe, that mm-hmm. have helped you along the Quirky Journey path. But if there's anyone that has any questions, they can obviously contact uh, me through the couch. But even just on Facebook, at Marcus D. Pierce is pretty easy um, to connect as well. But, you know, it'd be great to have people there. But I do want to say that don't come for gut health. Please go up to far north <laughs> Queensland for these guys. Um, <laughs> You feel so know. guilty about running it on the same day. As <laughs> oh, you, you, know, like, you know what? Every time I run this it's event, fine, it, it's okay. <laughs> last year, the reason why I get a bit funny is because it seems to be like last year was exactly the same with Cindy O'Meara and Lawrence Tam. Um, because there are so many people in this network now, and so many of us run our own events, there are so many clashes. Um, oh, okay. But I just think I it's think really important to remind people that they all have focuses. different value offerings. Yeah, yeah exactly. and I think like like we were saying earlier, for those that need you know, that help to get their family healing from the inside out. Um, that's what we're focusing on and, you know, it's it's different. So yep. if anyone has questions about exactly what each retreat is about, you can contact us and we can explain. But, yeah, we're not we're not here to get one up on each other, are we? We're all here to, <laughs> no, we're, for the we're, same we're purpose. We love to collaborate. <laughs> yeah, we yeah, like to collaborate absolutely. with each other and help each other out. So it's good. Yeah, we, we that's can what we love. On, um, help at quirkycooking.com.au so just send an email through to that email address and we can help you out with any queries that you have and uh, again our gut health retreat there's a banner for it on our website quirkycooking.com.au and of course our beautiful book life changing food is available on the website as well yeah. Marcus well thank you so much once more and uh, I hope to see you sometime soon me thank too you, I can't wait for a food hug and a Joe hug see you guys <laughs> thank you thank Marcus. Marcus see ya This has been a production of TheWellnessCouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on Facebook.com forward slash TheWellnessCouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.